Hey guys, Joe here, and in today's episode we are taking a look at something that probably shouldn't exist, but uh, I'm very happy that it does, and I think you'll enjoy checking it out with me. So stay tuned through the intro, and we will take a look at an FN masterpiece. If you're new to the channel, thanks for checking it out. I do appreciate it. Maybe consider getting subscribed down below. Use my Amazon affiliate link. She'll help the channel grow. And then we can take a look at cool stuff like this. Maybe even start purchasing some to use on the channel. I just found out that my local range is open again. So we'll be able to take these out and have some fun with them. At least some of the pre-owned stuff. As I said in the opening, this is an FN firearm and it is a kind of special one that was created for a program that went absolutely nowhere and rather than kill off the entire production they decided to release it to the public. FN along with Beretta, HK and a bunch of other companies all supplied firearms for a request through what was called the Joint Combat Pistol Trials. In 2005 and 2006, the U.S. government was considering replacing the M9A1 with a high-capacity 45 caliber firearm. They wanted it to be a certain weight, certain design features, certain elements that could be integrated into the pistol and just run throughout the entire production. Well, there were some problems with that request, mostly on the side of the government and the army and a few other branches because originally the plan was to replace all the M9s. It was going to be like a 600,000 piece order. The reason the program went nowhere and actually was killed off after 2006 was the fact that nobody could agree on exactly how many pistols they wanted or what the actual use case was going to be. The original SOCOM request, it was actually a combination between future hand pistols or I believe that's what it was called and the SOCOM program was they wanted 50,000 pistols for the SOCOM request but the rest of the military wanted to replace the M9 completely, so it was going to be a 600,000 pistol order. And unfortunately, they couldn't agree on it, and they wound up backing out of the 600,000 pistol order, and that caused the U.S. Army to drop out, and that basically killed the program. It went back to like a SOCOM style request, and at that point, it wasn't worth it to the military or the U.S. government to invest that kind of money into a brand new pistol for only a 50,000 unit order. However, all the companies that participated in that trial went ahead and released their firearms to the buying public. One of the most notable ones is FN. Another notable one would be Beretta with its PX4 Storm in 45 caliber. Because the request was for a 45 caliber pistol, a lot of really cool pistols were made. Not all of them made it into public hands. Thankfully, this is one of them, and this is what we're going to take a look at. Now that i put it off long enough, you can see it came in this really nice canvas bag. Inside the canvas bag, hopefully you heard me over the zipper, is a nicely packaged firearm. As you can see, you have the firearm Velcroed in. You have a total of three magazines, back straps, gun lock, and your information. For the purposes of this video, we are just going to be removing the firearm. This is why we have jump cuts, because Joe's an idiot and can't do things with two hands. I have it set on a piece of paper towel so that we can look at the trigger action in a little bit. I had a couple of comments that it was very difficult to see, so I'm using a very light background for that. Also makes the gun a little bit more visible as we're taking a look at it. Let's go ahead and safety check it, drop the mag, and lock the slide back. Always make sure you point it in a safe direction. Stick your finger in there, stick your finger in there, make sure there's nothing in there, and you can drop the slide. Don't know why all of a sudden it's a little bit of a bast in there, but, uh, you know, just deal with it. Taking a look at this pistol, this is not 100% the exact same pistol that was submitted for the trials. This is an FN X45. The original pistol submitted was the FN P45. Virtually identical, but the few changes are significant. Number one, they lowered the height of the barrel in the FNX. They brought it down just a few millimeters, but it was enough to change the feel of the pistol. They also changed the way the back straps work. You now get four back straps. Originally, the gun came with one back strap with two different elevations on either end, and you just flipped it depending on which version you wanted. Otherwise, a couple of finishing interior changes 
were made, but otherwise they're identical pistols. As you can see, because of the request of the US government, it has a threaded barrel and suppressor height sights. There's a lot of options for suppressors. This has a 0.578 by 28 twist to, or thread to it, so that's what you need to keep in mind if you are a suppressor adder. That's not the right way to say it, but hey, that's me. This is a fully ambidextrous pistol. As you can see, safety, slide lock, mag release on both sides. This is also a safety and decocker, meaning this pistol is double action to single action. You can start it in double action, you can start it in single action, you can do it either way. Some guns make you pick between having a safety or a decocker. This gun allows you to have the best of both worlds. In fact, you can even cock it while it's on safe. And while it's on safe, you can still manipulate the slide so you can load it and rack the slide while keeping the gun on safe. It's a trigger disconnect, so when it's engaged, it just kills the trigger. The slide is still manipulatable. That was almost a word. Let's go ahead and talk about the weight of this firearm. This firearm dry weighs 33.1 ounces. That is not light by polymer firearm standards, but it is light by a double stack high capacity 45 standard. For a comparison, this is a Kimber Warrior, which is an all steel gun. This gun weighs 39.5 ounces, dry. So a full six ounces heavier than that gun. The one thing I will say is the FN is much more top heavy. As you can see, even with my finger out here on the trigger guard, it wants to just fall forward. Whereas a traditional 1911, no matter where I hold it back on the trigger guard, it doesn't move at all. So the weight is much higher on this gun than a 1911. However, once you load up 15 rounds of 230 ball, it'll probably balance out the weight very nicely. As I said earlier, this has a double action to single action trigger. What that means is first shot can be done either double action or single action, but we're gonna start with the double action mode. So let's say you go ahead and you put your magazine in, you racked it, and then you decocked it. You put the gun back into double action mode. That means your first pull is going to be heavier, it's gonna be longer, but it's going to be a safer pull. The trigger pull is anywhere from 9 to 12 pounds, depending on who you ask and what day the pistol was built. This one feels closer to 10 pounds, 10 and a half ish. The pull is just nice and super straight. There's no staging to it. You just in, pull. In, pull. When it doesn't have any ammunition in it, it will reset to double action mode. But if you have a loaded magazine in it, it's going to then go to single action mode. And as you can see, the reset is way back here, and if I release the trigger, it's still way back there. So instead of being halfway out, it's almost all the way back. And then the subsequent shots are going to be, right there's the wall, and then boom. It's like a three and a half pound to four pound trigger at that point. What way you decide to carry your pistol is up to you. Personally, because it's available, I would carry it cocked and locked. That's because I'm a 1911 guy, and that's the only way you can carry one of these on safe is cocked and locked. You can do that. You could also just decock it and run it double action, or you can load it, decock it, and then cock the hammer while it's on safe. Whatever you decide to do, that's personal preference. Just since you have an external safety, go ahead and use the damn thing. The trigger guard is enlarged compared to a standard gun. As you can see, the 1911 down here has a standard trigger guard. And even though it's not as big as some, I can still get a gloved hand in there. This thing is designed to be worn with combat style gloves. Thicker gloves if you're in inclement climates or if you're wearing those tactical gloves that have like the shields over each pad on your finger. So you can definitely get in there. It also has a very nice undercut to it so you can get really high up on the pistol which is good for controls. So the beaver tail, beaver tail, it's not a real beaver tail, comes up but it doesn't shroud the hammer at all. So unless you have very generous proportions on your hands, you should never get a hammer bite or a slide bite because of the height of the frame to slide ratio. But there's always a chance that if you're not controlling your firearm and you have a lot of meat back here, you could get some hammer bite, but I highly doubt it. This gun has Trijicon night sights and they are suppressor height ready. 
which is really nice to have if you like to run suppressors. I've never actually fired a suppressed weapon. I'd like to. Uh, hopefully someday I will hang out with somebody that has suppressors because I don't feel like going through the paperwork to get one myself. This one also has an optic cutout on here. You just remove those two screws, take this plate off, put the adapter plate on, and then you can run other stuff. Trigicon makes a few sights that are designed to coat with this, with this higher sight. Then you'd have the dot appearing on your front sight, which is pretty damn cool. Now one thing you'll notice is that the barrel is a little bit extended because of the threaded portion. It needs to stick out so that the suppressor can come back and sit flush with the front of the gun. That gives you a little bit more barrel length even though the frame length or the slide length isn't full. This is a 5 inch gun. This is a 5 inch barrel or 4 and 3 quarter inch barrel even though the slide is technically a 4 and a half inch gun. Standard 1913 style pick rail on the bottom. Everything I'm showing you were requirements for the U.S. military trials or the JCP uh, trials, the combat pistol trials. Let's go ahead and take it apart now. First thing we need to do is go ahead and lock the slide back and do another safety check. It takes three seconds, guys. Three seconds of your time can ensure that you don't accidentally discharge into a computer monitor or your friend's face. You will need to take the threaded barrel protector off should come off really easy. If it's not moving, you should oil it or at least stop and go see your local gunsmith. While the gun is back, go ahead and take your takedown lever and drop it into the vertical position. That's all you have to do. Release your slide and pull it straight off the frame. Very easy to do. Hammer fire pistols do not require a trigger pull to release them. As you can see, it is like a lot of modern polymer guns in that it has a guide rod with the spring on it and a uh, drop link or a uh, short recoil system as it's referred to which is John Moses Browning's design which has been adapted to this particular firearm. Go ahead and pull your recoil spring out and you will notice that it is captive. If you have a tactical gun without a captive guide rod spring it's probably not really a tactical gun. The barrel comes out the way that most of these new style breech lock pistols do which is why we had to take the threaded protector off because it wouldn't fit through the hole. And then you can see, much like a Glock or a Smith & Wesson or many of the breech lock style guns, it doesn't have lugs up here. It locks up at the front of the breech and underneath here you have your tilting locking mechanism. So it comes down, slides up in there, and then locks in place. One thing you'll notice, this is where they got the additional few millimeters of drop for the barrel. It is cut up higher than the FNP. This also allows the barrel to move back almost twice as far before it disengages from the slide so that it will keep the barrel straighter and lower to the bore axis, which is supposedly supposed to help with accuracy. This is a used firearm, but taking a look at it, it wasn't used very much and it seemed to have been taken very well care of. It does have a little bit of rust, kind of flash rust here on the back of the breech. I'll probably wind up cleaning that up and oiling it before I give the firearm back. Inside the frame you can see there's some wear here from the slide cycling against the top of the barrel. That is common. You're going to see that regardless of how many rounds have gone through it. That is normal. Don't worry about that. There's no odd machining marks. There's no chips out of the material. The coating is pretty thick and it's on the inside of the rails and all over. Personally, personal preference, I like to take emery cloth or a 1000 grit or 1200 grit and take the light coating off the rails as long as there's some room, as long as the gun feels tight. Don't do it if the gun feels loose because then you'll just make it looser. Speaking of which, let's take a look at the frame. It is a very common style, polymer style lower. This is not a modular control group like the Sig Sauer P320s, the M17 and M18 variants are. However, it's not hard to take apart. There's just a couple of pins to knock out. The guide rails for the slide on the front are longer than most polymer guns tend to have. You can see it's probably a good two inch long versus a lot of them that just have a small pad like what you see back here. These are interchangeable, and not interchangeable, but replaceable without having to replace the entire fire control group, which is nice. So if you damage one, you don't have to get an entire control group. You can just get the rails. As you can see, FN put in the effort to give you 
ambidextrous controls that actually work instead of it just being a really thin piece of metal that's attached to this side as you can see it's actually two separate pieces of metal that are engaging on their own the Remington for example has a piece of sheet steel that wraps around the front and just is connected to this slide lock and it barely works even on an empty mag you can't drop it or an empty empty gun with no mag in it you can barely drop the slide with the offside uh, slide lock. So there's your ejector. You can see it's kind of a curved piece of metal, so it actually will shoot them out sideways versus allowing them to just kind of... It will actually kind of direct them out of the firearm. I've had a few guns in the past that have very weak ejection patterns, and that's what it comes down to. If that's not a good design, the ejection is not going to be very good. Overall, the construction feels very solid. It looks really nice inside. Again, it's had a few rounds put through it, but not a ton. So, yeah, take it from that what you will. So there you go. It's field stripped. That's technically five parts. The threaded barrel protector is required to be removed because it cannot fit through the front of the firearm to be removed. So you do have to take it off. So it is five pieces. To reassemble it, it's super easy. Just take the slide, flip it upside down, take your barrel, make sure your uh, drop link it's not a drop link, it's just your cam link there, is in the down position, or technically up position in this case, and that the barrel locks into the breech. That's when you know it's positioned correctly. Take your guide rod, small end, big end. Small end goes into this hole in the front. Then you're going to use a little bit of strength to get the guide rod in line with the barrel. Make sure it's straight across, otherwise it could bind up when you reassemble the gun. You can go ahead and put your thread protector on there now if you like. And in case you're wondering, that is what it's called. It's called a thread protector. Because that's its only job, really. Take your frame, take your slide, mate them up. Go ahead and pull it back. Once you make sure that it can move freely, bring it back and lock it into position. Once you've done that, just go ahead and drop your takedown lever, 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 and release the slide. Rack it a couple of times, make sure it's functional, and yep. So, what do I think of the FNX 45 Tactical? Well, I really like it as a pistol, however, there is one subject we need to discuss and that is the fact that a FNX tactical will cost as much as a Kimber Warrior. Actually I think the Kimber Warrior is slightly more expensive but not by much. This is a $1400 pistol from FN. If you can get one you're going to be paying retail right now. If it wasn't pandemic time you might be able to get one a little bit cheaper. This one was used and it was still a thousand dollars. So keep that in mind as you're looking. You can call the store Liberty Arms down in Harrisonburg, Virginia. You'll have to Google it. I can't put a link to it. But if you want to get one of these and you can wait for production to resume, give them your information. They'll hunt one down for you. They have a lot of sources. Pretty much all the distributors that are available, they're signed up with. And the ones that they aren't, they can sometimes get signed up with just to get one gun if need be. So they'll take care of you. Just, send, just tell them that I sent you. In terms of my personal feelings on the firearm, I like it. I had the non-tactical version of the FNX 45. I had the USG version, which was just a regular barrel, no threading, no suppressor height sights. And I think the barrel was at the standard height versus this one. Don't quote me on that part. If you own them both, let me know. This one is definitely worth a look if you're looking for a high capacity 45 that is not overly heavy. It's also one to consider if you like suppressors. There are not a whole lot of high capacity 45s out there that are suppressor ready, so keep that in mind as you're looking. That's about it. Thank you guys so much for joining me and taking a look at a pistol that shouldn't exist, but we're happy that it does. If you have any questions, leave them down below. Any comments, leave them down below. If you have the FNP Tactical, let me know how you like it. If you have both of these pistols, let me know if you can feel any difference with the somewhat lowered barrel. I look forward to interacting with you guys. Don't forget to subscribe and use my Amazon affiliate links. Check out other videos on the channel. There's almost 80 related to firearm. It's in its own playlist, Jiminy Shoots. Or you can go ahead and check out all the videos. I make a new firearm video every week, so come back for that, or just check out the other stuff. My name's Joe, this was The Jiminy Show, and as always, I'll talk to you later.